evening to all of you and welcome. Um, my name is Neria Leva Gutierrez and I'm the Executive Director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. We are so happy that you're here tonight for NOMA's Learn with NOMA 2021 Technical Assistance Series. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to thank the New York State Council on the Arts for their support of this series. Tonight's workshop is entitled Artists Websites Best Practices. And we have with us the extraordinary Patricia Miranda, who is an artist, curator, and educator, among so many other things, including a wonderful friend of Noma's. Um, and tonight she is here to draw on her extensive experience working with artists to examine best practices for website design, um, and particularly how to make a stellar website that successfully showcases your work. Uh, you are in excellent and expert hands tonight, and it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to Patricia. Patricia, welcome. All right, we're gonna talk tonight about uh, website best practices. I'm gonna talk just for a few minutes about um, myself, um, not because this is about me, but because I want you to get a sense of the perspective that I bring to this particular uh, workshop, because it is a very particular perspective. I am an artist, an educator, and a curator. Uh, I am not a web designer, and I am not a web technician, right? So, uh, and I think that makes, uh, is important for this workshop because of the perspective, the kind of peculiar perspective or peculiar place that artists occupy in a business uh, environment. And I'm going to talk about that some more. So this is an, an image of um, my most recent solo exhibition that closed November 7th. Uh, you can see that I work in installation and textile. This is a project that is partly funded by um, uh, by an uh, Arts Westchester NISCA grant and the Lace Archive. You can read all about that. And so um, that's a little bit about my practice, just very little. Um, I also am the founder of the Crit Lab, which is a an organization for working artists. It's not for students. It's for working artists who are interested in critical discourse around their work. And we, I run five month, uh, very intensive, they're like graduate seminars and critique. And um, so a five month conversation with a small group of artists. We, I also run the Alt MFA, which is a four day conference that we just had in November where I bring in a lot of visiting artists. And I have um, developed a residency in the, the Alps in Italy where we also go to the Venice Biennale. So, in the Crit Lab, I have about 60, more than 60 people in the program every semester. And, uh, and so I am in intensive conversation with artists about their work, um, 60 artists every month in in-depth conversation. So I talk to artists a lot. I'm a big advocate of artist-run culture, artists you know, organizing opportunities for themselves, supporting one another, building community, and all of that. So I think a lot about these things. I think a lot about the pedagogy of like artistic ecosystems. I'm also a curator. This is an image of my of the most recent exhibition that just closed December 2nd, which is called Haptic Somatic. It was an art, um, an exhibition that focused around artists thinking through uh, new tech, new and old technologies. So a lot of, you know, it was everything from 3D printing to video installation to so, uh, solar powered sound machines to NFTs. And so artists thinking about technology's relationship to our bodies. Uh, this is an exhibition that I curated a couple of years ago called um, Material um, Lamentations. And this was an exhibition about solastalgia, which is artists response is grief of, for climate change, basically solastalgia is. And this is artists who are thinking about climate grief and expressing it through their own work. This is an exhibition that was a few years ago when I was director at Con of the gallery at Concordia College, another, art another exhibition uh, with artists working, uh, environmental artists working across a wide spectrum of media and languages to think through artistic uh, environmental questions through the language of art. So that's just a very short, um, you know, overview. And the reason I, I, the reason that I show you that is because as a curator, I literally have looked at hundreds and hundreds of websites. And I've thought a lot about what is, you know, how that is, well, when I'm looking at them as a curator, or if I'm on a grant panel or something like that, and you're looking through lots and lots of information, you begin to see some things that work 
better and some things that don't work quite as much. So, um, so for that, so as a curator, when I'm doing research, research in for artists that I already know, research to find artists that I don't know yet, um, all those kinds of things. And then when I want to find work in particular or new work, uh, choosing using work for a particular exhibition, et cetera, et cetera. I spent a lot of time doing deep dives into websites. And so uh, I think a lot about that. And, and I think that artists, um, you know, the, the website is, uh, websites are, and so I wanna say that because I wanna say in particular that I'm not a web designer. And uh, although I've designed and run and managed a lot of websites and currently I'm designing, managing content and running about five websites, my own and the Crit Lab and the Lace Archive and a couple of artists websites that I manage. So thinking a lot about that and thinking about how I've also done a lot of um, website analysis with artists and not, it's not really a technical analysis, which we're gonna, which is the way I'm framing this tonight. It's really about thinking about how is this space going to present my work in the best light possible? And um, the website analysis very often becomes a conversation of how to frame the narrative of your work, as opposed to like, is this link working or is this not? So sometimes I've worked with artists who have had a web designer design their, their site and although it may be very beautiful and functional in many ways, it may not serve the kind of peculiar place that artists occupy in, in the kind of business world, right? We're sort of an odd species. We are, we are entrepreneurs, we are, you know, we are thinkers, we are makers, we are, it's our vocation, it's our business. So there's a, a sort of a lot of complexity to the way that artists need to present their work or want, and want to present their work. So websites are a space where you tell the story of your work. I want you to think of that as the most important thing. It is the place where people go for a more in-depth view. So Instagram is an amazing place for artists now. If, if I'm, I'm sure this room is filled with artists and you use Instagram, it's wonderful. If I'm curating a show, however, I might find you on Instagram or get connected to you on Instagram, but I will go to your website to find out more about you, to find out more about your thinking, to find out more about your history and to look at an in-depth um, and to look more in-depth at your work. So before we even get to before we even get to thinking about a website, I wanna talk about something that has been a really big topic for me in the works that I do um, in the Crit Lab in particular, uh, in curating too, but in the Crit Lab in particular, because the Crit Lab was an in-person program. And when the um, pandemic happened, as I'm sure happened to many of you, we said, oh my gosh, this is impossible. We can't possibly look at work. We can't spend you know, hours and hours on Zoom looking at each other's work. Nobody is gonna be able to see my work on Zoom. It has to be seen in person. That's the only way, et cetera, et cetera. And we thought this wasn't gonna be possible. Now we all you know, acclimated. <laughs> albeit with you know, continuing the technical challenges along the way, which we just witnessed. Um, and, but we found that actually there were, some, there were a lot of really wonderful benefits to being in the digital space. So the first thing I did last year was to think about a pedagogy for the digital space. And that just means a way to kind of, you know, when you're an educator, it's like you have to you have to be able to explain to other people the things that you do yourself all the time. If you're a painter, you know, you don't think about how you hold a brush, but when you have to teach it to someone else, you have to think about it in a kind of a very systemic um, way or structural way. So I think about structure a lot. And so I thought a lot about what does it mean to be an object maker in the digital space, right? Where people can't necessarily touch or walk around or see your object in person. And so what does that mean for us as artists? It means a lot of things and, um, one of the really important things is that art in the digital space is not documentation, it is representation. And I say that really, I wanna make that a really important point because previously to thinking in, in, in this new way of the pandemic, we thought we are documenting our work. The website is a document of our work. I am taking pictures of my work as a documentation. People will see this documentation of my work. I used to in my, in my professional practice, um, lectures say you live and die by your documentation. <laughs> well, I have shifted that language because I think that when we think of the digital space, we want we need to think of the digital space as its own thing. If we think of it as documentation of the real space, then we are always thinking about it as an inadequate version of the real thing. Now, well, I'm not saying that it's a replacement for in any way, shape or form, right? There is nothing like being in front of an artwork that is made by a human person and, you know, with the energetic, that the energy that it has and the materials and all of that. 
incredibly powerful. And yet the digital space has a lot, a lot to offer us. And if we keep thinking of it as an inadequate representation, an in inadequate representation of the real, then we are probably going to sell our own work short in the digital space. So if we think of the digital space as its own thing, a very separate thing, it has its own language, its own vernacular, and we can treat it that way, then we can use the, the, um, the digital space in ways that will be really powerful for us as artists. As you probably know, you've been able, I've been able to Zoom with people all over the country, all over the world, and talk about art and share art and all of this. And that's been really exciting in a way that wasn't possible. So it doesn't replace being in front of an artwork, but it does bring a whole new um, possibility, a whole new sense of possibility. Now, in today's world, we all know how important representation is. I just can't say that strongly enough. Representation is the way that people are seen in the world, the way that people feel themselves to be seen, the way they see other people. And as an artist, it is the way our work gets seen in, in, the, in the manner in which we want it to be seen. And, and that means in the fullest sense possible, right? So thinking through the digital, I think is really important. So one of the ways I started thinking about it was if, um, of how we read images in the digital space, because we read, in, we read information digitally differently than we read it you know, in a book, a paper book, or read it in person, et cetera, et cetera. So if we can think of what is the nature, what is the, what is the nature of that type of reading, there are certain things that become very clear. And so representation, of a three-dimensional object, whether it is a painting, which is you know, a flat thing, or a sculpture that is a dimensional thing. And even, I might say, if you are an artist who works in a native, native digital form, in other words, your work is created and generated inside the digital space, you, can, you still need to think about how the narrative is communicated around your work. So all of this information applies across the board. So if we look at these two artworks here, um, I like to think about it as translation. And so representation requires translation. So for the work on the, on, on the left, I don't know if it's on your left, it's on my left, the, the work by Connie Brown, this brightly colored, very saturated um, painting, it is a painting, and you can see evidence of it. If you look closely, you can see some paint strokes and some, you know, there's some transparencies and opacities that are clearly painted. And at the same time, it is, um, it, it, it's an image that has, it's very graphic. The image, the color is very saturated. It's synthetic color, which is very uh, akin to digital, a digital language. Um, the shapes are hard edged. And so it communicates very well in the digital space, right? And I think about this as a, a kind of a translation loss. So if I am translating Pablo Neruda, the, the wonderful Spanish poet, I'm, if I'm translating his poetry into from Spanish into Italian, for example, there is a translation loss. You can't translate a poem literally word for word because it doesn't make sense. It's a different language, right? So there is something about the translation that is about the essence of one language and the other. And so I call that the translation loss, right? When someone translates from one language to another, they have to think about the word that is being used in the original language and then its connotation and then translate that into, this, into not necessarily even the same word, but the connotation in the other language. So Italian and Spanish are, are, are languages that have a similar root. They're both Romance languages. They share a lot of grammatical structures. They share a lot of words. And so that translation loss is there because they are not the same language. And yet that is not, um, that translation loss is not going to be very uh, huge, right? So if I look at this colorful work uh, by Connie Brown, I'm thinking that 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 work translates very well in the digital. There is still a translation loss. It is not the same as seeing this work in person. And yet that translation loss is different than the work on the right, which is Caroline, Caroline McMoran's work, right? This work is tactile, it's fabric, it is installation, it's something you walk around. It has lots of very, very detailed, delicate things that are impossible to see in the photograph. And so that translation loss is quite a bit wider. So I might think of it as a translation from Russian into Spanish. Different, you know, different structure in the language, different alphabet, right? So the translation loss is wider. So when you are thinking about depiction, representation of your work in the digital space, one of the ways that I, I find helpful is to think of it as a translation from one language to another. So you are translating the image into the digital language. Hold that it thought when you are going through and thinking about your work. And so for Caroline McMoran's work, you know, seeing the whole work, 
right, is going to become enormously important to get a sense of the space, to get a sense of what this object actually is, as well as some very uh, up close and intimate details so one can see both the physicality of the whole and the materiality of the detail. And this, when one has the juxtaposition between this and this, one can see, right, one, this is what I call an access to the real. This tra the translation is the access to the real. In other words, you are communicating to the viewer as much as possible information that will give them access to what this object actually looks like in person. We actually can read digital images quite well. It takes a little bit of you know, it takes a little bit of that translation, it takes a little bit of time, but once you do this, and if you start doing this with your images, you are able to communicate some things um, that can be quite difficult in a digital image, right? So this, di this digital image alone would not do that work justice because some of the things that the digital does is it doesn't have atmosphere, it flattens, right? Those are kinds of things. So one has to compensate and that's the translation loss. So if we look at this uh, wonderful painting by uh, Lisi Jorjuela, you can tell that it's a painting. It's very clear. We see lots of markers that tell us that it's a painting. The brush strokes are clear. There's a kind of softness, a juiciness that tells me that this is probably oil paint. I know that it is, but if I was reading this, I know enough to understand that. Um, and there are a lot of things that I can't tell about this, right? One of the things that the digital space does is it can't communicate scale. One of the reasons, if I put this piece it on the screen with another piece and one was very small and one was very large you would not be able they would the, the digital space would equalize that difference even if the size of this image was written underneath the underneath here next to her name um our brains have a very difficult time translating that into like how our bodies would experience this object in person so i like to think of these these translation spaces, right? The translation, the spaces of translation loss as spaces where you can place the viewer's body in relationship to the work. Once you do that, people can see what you are doing and it becomes really clear. So if uh, Lisi has something like this, a context shot, right? We instantly, I, I'm like, oh, you know, look at this. I understand. I understand something about the scale of this work, right? I understand also something else really important. So and those, those paintings are actually six feet wide. They're really quite large, right? Which when you look at this, you know, I might say, okay, I don't think it's a tiny painting, but there's no way that I might have gotten the information that it is um, a 70 inch painting. So when I see this, I can suddenly understand. I see the paintings on the wall. I see them as physical objects and I see them in relationship to one another. And this is not even um, a professional shot. This is a shot she took, um, you know, as a way to, to show scale and all of that. The other thing I can see is I can see that the painting, despite the fact that a painting is flat, a painting is still, in when it's in the world, it is still an object, right? It's still a physical thing. So one of the things that one has to think about translating is the physicality of the work. And so if I saw this, and then I go back to this, I have an entirely different and deeper understanding of this picture that I'm looking at. So I can see that it's on canvas, it's fairly thick, you know, these are large pieces, and I suddenly have, um, I'm suddenly able to put my body in uh, relationship to the work. So if we go back to Connie Brown's work, uh, we might say, well, this is a perfect depiction of this work, there is nothing else that needs to be done, it's translating beautifully in the digital, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, there's something that's happening in this work that is also contributing to a little bit of distancing, right, from our understanding of the physicality of the work, and that is the painting is cropped. Now, artists, I talk to artists all the time, and they're like, what do you mean? We've been cropping our paintings for <laughs> decades. We always crop our paintings. That's what we do. Well, I'm here to tell you to stop cropping your painting. And the reason I'm here to say that is because you see that one of the things that the digital space can't do is it has no atmosphere. It can't communicate space, right, around a thing. And when you crop, it flattens the image. Cropping always flattens. And so despite the fact that I can see some indications that this is a painting, um, I could also be, you know, I might think, well, this could be a silkscreen or a lithograph or some other, or even a digital image, right? 
it might be a digital image. There's not really an indicator that tells me that this is a, there's not a, I mean, there are some, again, you can see some brushstrokes, but there's not a definitive indicator that this is a physical object. And so this is a subtle shift for this work. It's much more dramatic on other works, but here is an image of this painting photographed on the wall where we can actually see a part of the wall. So we have a shadow on the bottom. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, it's a little washed out in this <laughs> digital space, but now I understand, oh, this is an object. And if you look at the bottom here, right along here, I hope you can see, do you see that there's a, you can actually see the edge of the painting. And I see a little evidence of like the lip of paint. People tend to think the cropping makes it look cleaner, but the thing that it does is that you lose the edge and the edge of a painting is very important. We see how the paint might've, you know, bled over, or, you know, we see the edge of the wood or whatever. It might be. So I understand that this is a physical object now. Now, this is um, a piece that's on paper, and um, you can see. So she could have photographed this is Rita Moss's work, a conceptual rules based work where she does these, she does many, many, many of these using a very interesting process. Um, she might have photographed it, right, cropped in, but we would have no idea, really, whether this was digital or not digital. And, and her work is about the kind of interface between a physical object and a digital object. So lots of interesting things to explore. But we see clearly, even though this is not the, you know, the highest res image, we still can see that, oh, this is on a piece of paper. I can see that this is on a piece of paper. So it's some kind of physical thing. It gives us some information, some indication of what that object is. So detail shots, enormously important. We already saw that in Mac Moran's work, the, the textile work, right? The details are incredibly important because when you step back, and this is true for my work, when you step back to, to take a, an image of a very large installation, it might look great, but it might be very hard to understand what that components of that installation are. So this is a small object photographed beautifully for a sculpture, right? It's on a, it's on a gray, a, like a neutral, mid-value gray, sort of light to mid-value gray surface. So what is what does that give us? It gives us atmosphere. It gives us space around the object. We understand, and, and really it's very clear that this is physical. So like photographing sculpture on a white ground or on a black ground is not generally going to, it's going to, those are going to eliminate atmosphere. Now there's always exceptions. There might be something where the perfect thing is to be on a black or a white background, but I'm speaking in generalities here and it's probably the majority of the time, you're not going to want to have photographed sculptures on a black or a white background because those will increase the way that a digital space, they will exacerbate that flattening. Now, detail, very important detail. Um, again, like we saw in Mac Moran's work, a detail has a big job to do because you can't have, I mean, you can have on your website many details, but you can't have all details, right? One needs to have, be able to show a bunch of um, objects and then pick select details. And so therefore the detail has to accurately represent the object that it is detail of, but it also has to give us information, give us insight into the way this artist uses materials. So that when I look at the next image, I, I'm like, oh, I understand this artist uses materials in this kind of way. And I can extrapolate into a full image that might not have a detail, some of the information in the detail. And so we have a detail here of this work. I now see, okay, this artist is using all kinds of, you know, like piling materials on and, and gluing them and painting them. There's all kinds of stuff going on there that I now, when I go back to this image, I have a lot more information. I think it's like somewhere around here, right? Um, I have a lot more information about what this object looks like in real life. Something like this, again, Erica Roth, it's a large installation. We might think, oh, what, what a cool object I can kind of see. Um, I, you know, I have a kind of a sense of scale because it's in a space, um, but I'm not really clear about what the materials are. And so therefore a detail, right? In other words, these things work in tandem and this detail would want to be something that tells you, that gives you more information, not only about this work, but about the practice in general. So the fact that there's a lot of braiding, there's things being woven together is kind of signature thing that, that this artist does. And so now I know that I have information when I move forward. So here's a piece by uh, the same artist, Erica Roth. So if, when you look at um, shots of this piece that are just the entire thing, right? At sort of what we would think as, you know, documentation distance, it would be impossible to tell what this was, what the materials were that this was constructed with. And 
yet this is like a detail and a, an installation shot in one, right? She's chosen an angle so that we see up close, okay, lots of braiding, there's beads and ribbons and all kinds of different materials. So when I go back and look at this, I understand what I'm looking at. I know what I'm looking at. I have a much better understanding of what this work looks like. Um, Sometimes panoramic shots can be really helpful. They're, all, they're, 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 they're helpful when the space is not so wide. You've all seen panoramic shots, which are like then end up being an inch tall, right? And really wide and you can't, you can't see what anything is. That's not generally helpful, but something like this, where it's only distorting a little bit to get the whole of the room, really gives me a sense that I could walk in this room. I kind of have a sense of how it might feel to be in this room, to, to see these objects. And then if the next image was like one of these or this, I would have a much better understanding of how I would encounter, oh, that would be above me. I would be looking up at that, right? This thing is much bigger than me. I would be walking around it. So this would give me a lot of information about how I will encounter this artist's work. Again, um, this is, you know, this would not necessarily be like a straight documentation picture, right? Where everything is in the shot, it's straight on, everything's in focus, which might be, a beautiful photograph, but maybe would give us a hard time understanding what this is. So this is a, you know, we see a beautiful close up. So this is, um, you know, pushed back and not in focus. But the most important thing is that, oh, I understand what this is. I can look at a lot of these other objects now and I understand what they are. And I think this is a double of another picture. So I'm going to talk about it in a second. So we have different kinds of images. We have both formal images, you know, exhibition images, or even like Lisi Orjuelo's work where she put it in the space. So that's like a slightly more formal. And then we have studio shots where we see things in progress, right? The website is a space where one can unfold the narrative of the work in lots of different ways. And so having both of these, I know these aren't the same work, but you get a really strong sense of the type of work that this artist makes, whoops. So, Studio shots are really great. I mean, look at these two studio shots, Deb Peebles and Mary Dondero. I instantly have a very strong sense of these two artists, right? Deb Peebles studio shot, like even her furniture looks like her paintings, right? It's very clean, it's very, very perfect. Everything is aligned, clearly like a sense of color and design. Um, and, and all of that is very important to that work. And in Mary Dondero's work, you get a sense that she works, it's more visceral work, there's more, it's more tactile work and all kinds of things are happening in there that gives us a lot of information that we then go on when we then go on to look at an individual work. So this is a shot of Mary's work here. It's not a detail, but it is a cropped shot. And I, I've already had a, done a website analysis with Mary where I said, you know, the cropping is not really doing any, it's really not um, showing the work in its best light. It's doing, it's taking, it's like a making a translation loss that doesn't quite um, communicate. Whereas here, I can see these images and I, oh, I see these are on paper, they're fairly large. I get a sense of what they are. And then when I see this, I can go back and say, oh, it looks like pastel. It, it has a certain kind of feeling. So these things work in tandem, especially on a website, right? Studio porches, this is Ruhi Salim, who is showing herself in her studio in, with her painting. We get a sense, oh, she works with a palette knife. She's, you know, there's a lot of information in there that when I go and look at the painting, also scale information, which is again, something that is really important to communicate in the digital space because the, the digital, digital space equalizes scale. Um, again, one more, now this is a studio portrait, right? Which you might have on your about page or something where you have a picture of yourself in how you decide that to be. Look, we're not academics. You're not gonna have a headshot. You're not, you know what I mean? We're not actors or academics. We want our pictures of ourselves to be kind of representative of the kind of um, profession we're in. So artists will often have studio shots as their portrait shots. Um, so the website is a space. I want you to think about the website as an actual physical space. I'm very visual. I think of everything as a visual thing. So I think of it as like a building, right? Um, a building that you're going to invite people into. And that building is going to have different rooms. It's gonna have rooms where, you know, that are very public, very formal, rooms that are, that are more relaxed or more um, personal, rooms that are very informational and rooms that are purely visual. And if you think about that, you can frame different parts of your practice in different kinds of ways. So, um, you know, so the primary thing when you're thinking about a website is to think about um, is to think about your vision. And 
I can't, you know, there are so many different visions. Every artist's vision is different. And so the websites are going to look quite different. The priority for you is the, the vision that you have as an artist should be the guiding light for your website. And every decision that you make in the website wants to refer back to that. So there are practical concerns, of course, but the practical concern should always follow the conceptual concern. In other words, the way that you want somebody to understand your work and to begin to know it and discover it and investigate it through the website. So it makes the work visible and the vision visible. It, it is an exhibition space, a formal exhibition space. It is also a studio visit, as you saw in some of those studio shots. So think about what your goals are for your site, how you want to frame the vision and the narrative for your work. And you prioritize those goals. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. And that will give the clearest and truest representation of your practice as an artist. So instead of thinking of the website as a place where documentation of your work lives, think of it as a representation of your artistic practice. And that is going to open up lots of possibilities. And it's also giving, going to give you lots of ways to frame the questions that you might have in when you are designing your um, website. So your space will have different rooms, right? They offer different experiences, information, outcomes. Um, and so really important, um, the curatorial. This is the most, right, always, 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 the most important thing is the artwork, right? The artwork, everything wants to kind of support that. All of the other stuff on the website should support the artwork. And so one doesn't put up images kind of arbitrarily or in you know random groups or in ways that, some of the ways that I see artists organize their images a lot, and some of you probably do, so don't feel bad, we've all done this, is either by year or by media. Uh, you're not a, your vision is not by year and your vision is not by media, even though but the media especially can be very, very important. Um, your, your work is framed by the conceptual ideas, the things that you're thinking about in the work. And that is true whether you are a formal abstract painter or you are a conceptual you know, installation artist. The way that curators will look at your website is they are looking for the narrative. They are looking for the curatorial. Um, and so if you have a lot of images, you know, people will throw up 50 images on a page that can just become a kind of a doom scroll. Organize those images into, you know, bodies of work or different, uh, you know, titled bodies of work or series or things like that. Those are some of the ways that you can think about that. Um, and then there's the informational part. Those are the texts around the work, the artist statement, the CV, uh, bio, those kinds of things that are generally required or, mm, well, nothing is required. You can make your website however you want, but they're usually the things that people are looking for, right? And then the website can do other things like have more personal things, which are process shots, work in progress, um, technical uh, shots, right? If you make, if you do some, if you use some material that is, um, I work with a lot of natural dyes and pigments. And so, so I'll often have pictures of the process because that is interesting. It gives people more insight into my thinking and into my work. It's not, it's not the sort of primary vision of the work, but it is how it is part of the, the landscape in which that work is um, constructed. And so also the personal is a place where you might tell a more personal story that if you were writing a proposal for a grant or an exhibition or something that you might not include, but the website is a place where you might have the formal artist statement and then you might have a more personal story about your artistic journey. And then there's the commercial and how the commercial sits in your inside your website is very individual, right? Um, I uh, like on the Crit Lab website, for example, we have all of the artist groups get a page. So everyone has a portfolio page and that page is like an artist statement and some images. And then I have a separate, an entirely separate page, which is an entirely separate room, I would like to say, which is called flat file, which is a shop. And that is like images of work. There's price tags on there and all of that. But I have separated it from the sort of more curatorial because I feel like those things serve different purposes. And so um, I think that's a thing to think about. People often ask me, should I have prices on my website? Should I not? I think you can have a shop. And in that place, it makes perfect sense, right? A shop is a place where you have prices. Whereas in your portfolio pages, maybe you don't, um, you, have, you separate them. Again, everybody's practice is different. And you want to think, in other words, in some ways, you want to think about what is the direction your website is facing. And for us as artists, our web, we're often doing multiple things. We are 
we have, maybe you're applying to jury shows, you're writing proposals for exhibitions, you are uh, selling work in commercial spaces, and you are doing studio stuff. So those all have slightly different, um, they're all related. And so again, under the umbrella of the vision of your work, does it make sense? Does this make sense inside of that particular practice is the way that you can construct a very meaningful and you know fun and interesting place for people to visit. So you're, of course, the portfolio is is primary, and the portfolio is, um, you know, I can't stress enough to curate your images and to curate them in a way that, as if you were having an exhibition. So every page should feel like an exhibition. Now I don't mean in how formal it is. I just mean in how you organize the image, the order you put them in, how many images you put. Do you put everything in? Do you take some out? Do you, you know, how does one put those images together so that they begin to build? Remember, you're making a case for the work. You're building the story about the work. You wanna get people interested and then want them to continue to be interested. And um, to do that, they want to know how you're thinking, how you're organizing the images. So definitely curation is incredibly, incredibly important. And it's also difficult. It's difficult to curate our own work. We don't ha always have like the objective um, vision. But I would say if you were gonna have on a page, say 20 works, right? You, you, know, you kind of throw them up, right? You upload them. And, uh, but then I want you to think very carefully about how someone is going to read them, whether they're scrolling down, how they are read, and what is the order that best serves the work? This is the way you would think if you were hanging this work in an exhibition, right? You might put these two works together. You might have these across from one another. You might not put these two together. You might have them sort of further apart. You're in a sense creating a visual narrative, a visual narrative, which is you know different obviously than a sort of prose narrative, but still it's a narrative just the same. So some of the things we've talked about, don't crop the work, list. The other thing that I, I happens a lot is the um, people that use the term mixed media and artists always like <laughs> give me the shop shocked gasp when I say don't use that term because they're using it. I mean, the reason for that is in all the years I've been curating and I've been on grand panels and I've done these things, I when someone says mixed media, I don't know what that means, right? In other words, it could mean anything. It could mean anything under the planet. And so if it's hard for me to read the photograph, right? then I'm not going to know what that image is. And I have actually passed over work because I was looking at the image and I couldn't figure out what it was. I, could, I had no sense, right? That translation loss was too great for me to bridge. And I just couldn't, I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't go further with the work. And so everything that gives people an understanding of what the object is. Um, so remember that the texts and that includes your materials and also your statements and stuff like that are things that don't explain the work. I know artists get really, frustrated over artist statements. Artist statements don't explain the work, but they give people insight into the images that they're looking at so they better understand what that thing is in the physical, right? So again, details, install shots, context shots, um, all of these are good. So some of the essential things that are found on the website are uh, a gallery page, right? Some people will call it a portfolio page, a work page. There's lots of different words that people use. You will find a word that feels, that resonates for you, that fits inside your vision, right? Makes sense inside your practice. There is an about page that often has your artist statement, your bio, your CV, um, and how those things are put in there depends on what kind of practice you have. Some artists don't have a CV on there uh, and, and many artists do, but certainly an artist statement and a bio um, I think the curators will often look for a CV because they just want to know, like, where you've been, like, what have you been doing, who you've been doing it with, <laughs> and that gives them more information about the kind of practice that you have. And by the way, it doesn't mean you have to have like a big long CV with lots of, you know, unbelievable things on it. People just want to kind of know you better. They want to understand the story better. And so everybody knows that, you know, we start somewhere and we might have a short CV, we might have a long CV. Um, in fact, sometimes a long CV is bad. You don't wanna, you don't necessarily have to show every time you did anything, you know, artistic in your entire life, you wanna be very succinct about it. Um, there's a news page which might have upcoming things, projects, press, Sometimes the press page is a separate page. If you only have one press, then you're gonna put it in news. You're not going to make a separate page for it. Um, and then some of the other things are, you know, social media, a links page, other texts. Some people are write also, some artists write also. If you do curatorial or community projects, there might be other ways that you um, pull out separate categories for your practice. But in essence, these are some of the things that will always be found. And then one can extrapolate on those and make them visible in, in different ways. 
Um, so I'm going to just show you just some some few, a few home pages, and then we can get into some questions and and stuff. Um, this is a this is what is called a splash page, and a splash page is not actually the website. It's it's like a it's like a pre site. You see how it says enter here, and then when you enter the page, when enter the website, this is actually the website. Now some people think a splash page is and so the 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 pros are like oh it's exciting it's a new thing it gives gives people interest it's it's kind of a dynamic page it might give information sometimes you might have show information on there and then the con is that it's an extra click right like I, in order to get into the site i actually have to click on it um so it really depends what is more useful to you um this is sort of a classic this is the connie brown who's artist we look whose work we looked at earlier. This is a kind of classic, right? Single image on the page and then broken down by year. Now, I, you know, again, I am not, um, and this is to criticize any artist, right? We're all working at this. And believe me, I've redesigned my website on a regular basis when I realized something that I was doing was not um, working as well as I might've thought. But I feel like organizing one's work by year doesn't tell me anything about the work. So if I was here, I'd be like, oh, I have to go in and I have to look around before I have a real sense of what this artist is doing. Um, and then there's a page where there's a portfolio kind of open on the page and then divided up into different more more categories so the statement is pulled out the contact is pulled out there are lots of ways that one can do that but this is goes directly to kind of um actual images of work that you, you can click on this is uh not quite a splash page because it's not uh it's the actually page but it's like a bleed so this is inside the page in other words we don't have to click on it to get to the things but we can click on any of these um, categories to get information about this work. And archive is another thing that might be if you want to have more work on your website, but there's a lot and you don't like you don't want to overwhelm. And so very often an archive page is a good place to show work that maybe is five years or more, or maybe a little more it depends on the kind of work that you do, right? Some people make a lot of work every year and some people's work is much more um, durational, you know, longer term. Um, this is Rita Moss's work, whose work is very conceptual and very subtle, hard to communicate, right? And so she has an image of these pieces with a person that gives us a sense of the physicality of the object. And of course, if you're a performance artist, how do you <laughs> communicate um, the things that you do? This is a very dynamic picture that, you know, gives you a lot of information about um, what this artist does that maybe made me, might make me get excited to go into projects and um, see what that's all about. Uh, so a couple of the really practical things, and I can I can provide a PDF of this. We don't have to necessarily go into this in, in great detail, but you know we read websites different. So the two things once you've once you've thought about the vision, the two things you want to think about once you understand that everything is inside the vision, it's legibility and navigability, right? Things need to be visible, and people shouldn't have to like click, you know five times to find something. So that's navigability. They should be able to get back. Um, and we we read digital images differently now than we did even five years ago. So if your website was designed five years ago, they might be might look, even though it's five years, right? Um, it might look a little bit outdated, right? We used to say when websites were even maybe 10 years ago or something, I don't know, that like don't have anything below the end of the screen, right? But now that we're all on on devices, the scroll is the model, right? We're scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So scrolling down is very common now. It used to be, don't ever make anybody scroll down. Now we all scroll down. So thinking about how people read the digital space is really important. Um, and then there's a lot of other sort of little detailed practicals, but I think I can I can come back to those if that seems like um, they're good questions. Um, some of the things like don't make me click for an image. I think contact forms, like where you fill something out, um, in my experience as a curator, I have never gotten a response when I filled out one of those forms on a website. So I don't know if that's a failing in the thing. The other thing about that is I have no record that I sent that email. So I don't use those. I will always copy the email and do it because then I have a record. I'd be like, I fill out that form. And then I'm like, did I email that artist? I don't remember. I want to have a record if I'm a curator, right? I want to know that you didn't respond to me, <laughs> you know, so I can follow up. I can email again. I know that email is really difficult. So, um, and drop downs are 
are things that often like if there's a drop down and it's just words, I have to kind of it's a guessing game. I have to just say, oh, I guess I'll just choose this one. Whereas uh, like a grid of images helps me get some more information um, about what I'm looking at. And so I can make just informed choices and then, you know, ask um, an art person and a non art person to um, look at the website and navigate the last quick thing is, um, and I know we're, you know, because of our technical thing, we're a little bit um, over, but um, that part anyway, is there are these apps where you can place your work into a domestic space or place your work into a gallery space. So if you don't have images of like good exhibition images, then you can still get them because you can, um, you can get this app um, I mean, you can even go into a, a like a, a space where there's a big empty wall, take a photograph of it and plop your work into that. And you can also use these apps where there are lots of opportunities to, to put your work into the spaces. I'll say one thing about this, which is that some are particularly like digital, uh, sorry, domestic spaces or like corporate spaces. Those are really good for your shop page. When you're looking for like portfolio curatorial page, I am much more inclined to want to see something that is much more of a gallery space than like something with a lot of furniture. So again, they serve different purposes. They're both really good, but they serve different purposes. And then the last um, thing is, these are just some, I mean, there are so many, but these are some of the common websites that artists use that are very um, easy to use. And I can talk more about the technical like um, you want to have a content management system, a, a template system like these so that you can update your website easily, because if you're relying, we're artists, we, can, we don't have like full time web designers, we can't wait for, you know, our friends, brothers, sister to update information on our website, and then they got a job and they can't do it. So you want to find a template website where you can build it. Maybe you have hire someone to help you build it, but then you can update it easily because artists need to be able to update stuff frequently and regularly um, in ways that will be meaningful for them and you know keep their website current. And I think, and these are just the list of the artists that I mentioned. I wanna make sure that I give them the credit um, due to them, um, some amazing artists that I work with and, um, and that's it. <laughs> so that, thank, oh my gosh, thank you, Patricia. That's so much useful information. <laughs> I know I, I talk know. really, I talked really fast, but I, so please well, you feel free to, but you packed it all in. I think that was, um, I think, you know, also one of the interesting like final take homes that you mentioned, and I think it's really important to um, emphasize is it's always good to share your website with non-art people, non-art yes. entities, um, because, you know, I've learned that with um, funders, you know, some of them are not you know, artists or they're not art workers and, and they are not exposed to arts and, you know, in that kind of capacity where we sort of all take for granted what's being said, what's being conveyed and, and, and that kind of a thing. So I think that's really um, important to, to emphasize that it's really good to get a nice cross section of participants in reviewing your, your, your website. Um, and I also think that um, it's important I, I think this is valuable because it is true. While we all really rely on social media, and there's in sort of, um, I think a, you know, a, a kind of efficiency in social media. There's something really, I think, important and valuable about the website that is sort of the, you know, the kind of nucleus, and that, and you can go there, and you know, it's all there, and and you feel confident that you're not missing out on pieces that may, you know, have may may sort of have, you know, come and gone in social media because it, it is so reliant on that kind of immediacy. So I think I think that's a really valuable. Um, I mean, they work in tandem. Do you know what I mean? Like they yes. they work. They should work together. They should be serving one another and there are ways on on instagram where you can use linktree which is free where you can put different links into the into the um into your bio you know because instagram has very limited space so there are ways to do that and i will say as a curator i always will go to the website i will never i would never curate simply from instagram i will get i might find somebody and do that and then the other thing about the non i mean we have collectors we have curators we have you know interested parties we have people who are not artists who want to visit our website and learn about, you know, who we are and what we do. And Correct. so it's absolutely want it to be um, easy to navigate the things that you do visible. And um, yeah, so simplicity, 
ability to get around and all that is incredibly important. And there's some like really pragmatic ways to think about that, which I'm happy to talk about. But I wanted to really focus on this idea that what you're doing with the website is you are welcoming someone into your practice. And so, and I, curators are looking for this. They want to see who you are, what, what's your vision as an artist? What are you thinking about? They right. don't want to just see images. They want to know, in, they want information. And they also want the information, including the visual information to be framed. In other words, to be kind of, you know, in like to be part of a narrative. Sure. Um, yeah, so, it, tells, yeah. It's, it tells a story. And I, and I think also it does matter um, and it's a valuable to continually go in and update that. We have a few questions. I Great. think we have a question from Junya. Junya, are you there? Can we, would you like to unmute? Oh, and I was going to say, if we have time, I don't know if we will, if people, a couple, I thought I <laughs> meant to say this in the beginning, yeah. but tech stuff if you want to type your website into the chat we can take a look i won't do any this will be a very productive and constructive look um, if we have time second. okay Dunya, are you there oh she's got a lot of good music going on <laughs> um someone had a question in the chat which i'll just um respond um which website is the best for visual and video and also i mentioned that I maintain websites, um, you know, which websites are more user friendly. The ones that I listed are yeah. all content management sites. In other words, they are template based. So they're, you know, nothing is. Hold not on. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, I think she's okay. I'm here. I asked that question. Hi. Oh, good. So Junya, um, we're going to, we moved on for a second to Annette who had her question and then we'll come right back to you. Cause I know you had an interesting question as well. Yeah, so, I'm sorry, I, I was delayed. I had to switch off some music in the background. That's okay. Your music was very, it was great. At least. We enjoyed it. Just, you know what? We're, we're going to field Annette's question and then we'll come right back to you. Okay, thank so, you. And Annette was asking about like which websites are, are good for artists and musicians and which are more user-friendly. Um, you know, I can do a little research on the musicians' websites. Uh, because of course, every there's slightly different needs for different things, and a lot of artists use uh, Vimeo not as a website, but as a way to partner their videos in their website. Right? There's ways to have which the one? videos be in which one? Vimeo. Vimeo. Oh, no. Okay. Vimeo is not. It's not a website. It's but no, it's it's, it's something that works with your website so that you can host videos and have them on the website. Right. Um, but most of those websites that I listed, website, web hosts or whatever, um, Space, can, will, um, they have video and they all function a little bit differently and have different, slightly different templates, but there's a lot of similarity to the way that they function now. Well, um, the thing is what, 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 what I, I got my first website in 1999. I've always yeah. had a website, okay? Yeah. I mean, I had somebody take care of it. I've always had it, had it for 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, my, my nephew is a web de developer in, in the West Coast, but, you know, he's not going to do my website. Yeah. And like, it's, it's been like, you know, a year now that I've had it down. I still have the, I own the domain name. I got a couple of the domain names. And for, you know, I mean, for artists, it's different. You know, I'm not an artist, but I'm a musician. Well, you're an artist. I mean, yeah, I am an artist, but I'm not a, you know, I don't draw. I mean, I draw, you know, stage plots, but, um, <laughs> But the thing is that there's a lot of different things now. I mean, because a certain places, organizations want me to get my website back up. Yeah. But it's also the visual has always been important with the video and then also linking newsletters. And you were talking about emails and then maintaining. If I'm going to maintain, um, yeah. there's a different kind of a dialogue with people with social media, with artists, because I have Instagram account tons of you know this hashtags and with people can find my work but yes the website is extremely important but yeah. it is the work that you know and the the bottom yeah, line I, we have to I'm, take care I'm, of ourselves Annette I'm not gonna lie it's work I mean there's no doubt yeah. about it I mean the thing with artists is that we have to do it all right we are entrepreneurs yeah. we're the makers the researchers the the producers the you know what I mean we're the tech people all that. 
And so I, I mean, what I often recommend is, um, and you have the same questions as a musician, right? That we would have as a visual artist. In other words, how do I frame the vision of my work? Because you're this kind of musician and not that kind of musician, right? Like you make this kind of work and not that kind of work. And um, even if it's diverse, there's still a kind of, there's a you, there's the, the Annette, right? There's the vision that makes that work recognizable, that makes us know that it's your work and not the musician next to you. That's the vision. So if one frames the kind of narrative around the in the website around those ideas, that's the way that one uh, you want to think about it. Now, what I recommend for people for, for us and is that um, if it's I mean, it can be a lot of work to set it up right now. I've yeah, done a bunch. Good. So I'm right. So what I often say is if you can set aside a, like a, an amount of money and you don't have to go to a web designer because they are going to charge an enormous amount of money. But you can work that. with someone who is um, and I have people who work with me that I you know, that you can hire on my website. I'm not advocating, I'm not selling that, but I'm just saying I've done that because I know it's so hard for artists to do this, right? So we, we what we do oftentimes with artists in the Crit Lab is they will book a number of hours and they will, that person will set up, they will work with them. What are the needs? What are the vision? How do you want this to do? You know, they'll, work, they'll talk about the ideas and then that person will set it up. Once it is set up, it is a lot easier to update. Um, sure. There's way more details about like mailing lists and, you know, all of that kind of stuff that we won't have time to talk about tonight. Well, I, but do that, I do that with my, you know, I have had constant contact since 2007. So I'm, look right. at, I'm not a new girl here, but no, I'm <laughs> no, to... absolutely. I get it. Well, the thing is that the websites have changed. That's the thing, right? Like right. My... what I'm, I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to decide now if I want to use Squarespace. My nephew told me whip Squarespace is good with com. And I have to do it myself. And I like to hire somebody too, because it's always good to have a better cook in there. You know, so that's another thing. But then also be able to, I have to maintain it. Yeah. You know, but it is good. But again, a lot of people say different things about websites that some people do have and don't have because they have pages somewhere else, because you still have to do social media. But however, other people don't want to be in social media and you have to get to everybody. Look, if you, if you, if, if your primary, for some artists, their primary, um, you know, their primary sort of uh, residence, if you will, is social media, then maybe your website is there, but it's not as complex, right? Like you have a homepage, you have like informational stuff and a couple of things, right? Like it, and with someone like my website is fairly complex because I, I have curatorial, I have, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it really is very, in, it's very individual. And so you don't have to design a website that is overwhelming you can do something that's very simple so that at least when people go to search for you they are able to find you and they have contact information you know what i mean like if, uh, let me tell you if you have a page one page with contact information and a picture and that's it that's better than not having a page right like that is better than not having a presence because then at least people can reach out they can contact you they they know how to contact you yeah I'm and you know these things will change also as social media changes too so um you know like the scrolling thing is something that changed like a website 10 years ago, didn't do that at all, even five years ago. You know what I mean? So um, anyway, no, and also the websites have to be, the, the other thing that these, sorry. I'm sorry, hon. The other thing that these templates do is that they will, they will adjust it for like an iPad, a phone and a computer. Like they do that, they have that built into the templates. So you don't have to worry that like it works on the computer but it doesn't work on the iPhone, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, look, I'm happy to have a more in-depth, like a more, you know, sort of like in the weeds conversation with, with people um, if they want. But I know we had another question. We, Thank you. We, we Thank did. you. I think um, sort of related to what you were saying, and then Junya, I'd love for you to jump in here. Um, I think one of the things that I find valuable when I go to websites is that there's something that feels um, contemporary so that there's something that says like 2021, something that says, yeah. 20, you know, something that sort of lets me know that that website is current because I think because we've moved so much into social media, sometimes yeah. when you go into a website, you get this feeling that it's kind of, it's just been there for years and that maybe, you know, it's not really relevant. I always like there to be something that feels live, that feels dynamic, and that sort of tells me that this website is current in some way, shape, or form. So that's I, really I, important. It's yeah. really important because if the website is too, if it hasn't been, if there's been, and it doesn't mean you have to oh, redo the whole right. website. It doesn't have to be like a total right? It just rehab. means, right, a little something. more information. If you haven't updated your website in two years, people will be like, 
Mm, I don't know. Even I have seen websites where I've seen a quote and it says, you know, 2021. And I've, and I felt like, oh, good. That's, that's good. Like that's good enough. Because this person it, is still active, right? Like right, they're and, still and, right, and there's there's sort of sanctioning, you know, the accuracy of the website, which I think is really important. Um, let me get to Dunya. Dunya, we you started, so I'd like, are you are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Do you want to jump like, in and ask your question? Yes. Yeah, so, um, how would you like me to do this? Shall I just send you the link at first? Oh, sure. Um, Why don't you put the link in the chat? Patricia, yes, sure. put it in the chat. Okay. Yes. Sure. And while you're doing that, there's someone has a question like with platforms yes. like WordPress and, and Squarespace. Business, and I, they I do, they all they do, most of them do have a shop, uh, you know, a shop option um, on there. Most of the template-based websites do have that option now to do a secure um, checkout, whether it's artwork or CDs or whatever, to sell merchandise. Most of them do. But it's something you're gonna want to check, right? Like make sure. Do you have a um you know, I use iCompendium because I've been using it for years and he has the option to use PayPal or Square um, that I can put right onto the website. So uh, most of them definitely do. That's great. And right, so I think Dunya has um, put her website and then I think after Dunya, Elizabeth has a question too about her works. Okay. Um, so do you wanna pull that up? Patricia, can you I'm pull good. that up from I'm your- pulling it up right now. Okay, good. And I'm gonna share the screen. Okay. We'll hope that it, <laughs> we don't have any problems here. Um, it seems to be working now. Uh, yes. Okay. So do you have a particular question or do you want me to kind of? Yeah, um, the thing is, okay. So as a, first of all, I found your presentation uh, fantastic. Oh, good. So, and I took quite some cues, um, yeah, cues from it. So my question is this now, you know, is this my, the first, um, website of my work right now and the thing is if you um let's just if you click on one of the oh new page i'm sorry i was just opening this this is this is that's not, okay that's okay i get it it's a it's in progress yeah i was just like 10 minutes ago doing that so <laughs> if this is like one of the paintings yeah um it consists of two uh, separate paintings that are one so then I just took pictures of details of my work mm -hmm. that, you, that the viewer can actually see below. Yeah. So, and since I work with um, a lot of glitter and little pearls and all that stuff, so to make it very textured mm -hmm. and uh, um, a lot of made and, and glitter, um, let's say, uh, contrast. So yeah. it's very, very difficult uh, to photograph and to yeah. display. So, and I would really like, um, yeah. So the first thing I was, the first, sure, sorry. Um, the first thing I would say is, I mean, the pictures are, are the colors look great. They're, you know what I mean? They're, they're really clear. They're really vivid. I would say that this work is very large and I would say I would not crop. I would get pictures of them on the wall so that you can see part of the wall. Uh -huh. And then I would also have a shot and look, you don't have to have that for every single, you, I, I would say don't crop, like for all your, for all the paintings moving forward, I wouldn't crop the edge. Um, you don't need a, like a context shot for every picture, right? Like again, w once we have, uh, once I see a context, I say, wow, wow, this is a six foot tall painting and oh, I see it in a space. It could be standing, it could be sitting on an easel. It could be hanging on a wall. It doesn't have to be super formal or professional. Then I'm like, oh, I understand. I, in other words, I can place my body in relationship to the work. Your work mm -hmm. has a real physicality. And so the cropping is again, you're getting a bit of a translation loss, right? From the physical yes. object because of the cropping. So I think the details are great. I think all of that is great. The one thing I would say is that your name of your website is Candy and Lipstick. And I have to dig fairly deep to find out who you are. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, <of course>. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I don't have to dig that far. I can go to the about page, but I feel like, you know, um, you know, as an artist, our name is our brand in a sense. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So mm -hmm. although I think Candy and Lipstick is great, it sounds a little bit more like the name of a series than the heading of your website. Because if I was searching for you, I might not find uh, Junya, right? Because I it might only come up as Candy and Lipstick. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things that I would, I would say. This is yeah. great. You know, it has like a nice thing about your statement and all of that. So those are the just quick. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, um, I'm just 
You know, I was actually thinking um, if I should do video, it's so the glitter. I mean, my paintings actually really need to be seen in person. Yes. And this sparkle and glitter and you, I cannot. I well, I'll tell you something, I'll tell it. you something. Sorry, I don't mean to, <laughs> it's a little bit of delay. So I'm sorry if I keep talking over you, but um, I would say one of the things that you can do is take a picture at an angle. We think this is the idea, the difference between documentation and representation, right? Documentation, like you take a picture of a painting in front of a painting, but representation means how do I represent glitter? I might have to take a picture from an angle, right? A, a detail shot from an angle. So I can not only see the glitter, but I can see the physicality of the pigment because that like the physicality of this work, I can see because I'm very, you know, I have a lot of experience reading images, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that many people might miss that, right? Um, and so I think that showing the piece in context, not cropping the edges and details at like different angle is going to go a long way. And then the name, the name thing I think is, is. Um, so is, you can, when you click on the Instagram, um, the Instagram button, then you can see. Oh, up here, sorry. Yes, there you can see. On Instagram, I reference a lot of glitter stuff. And yeah, I mean, look, you can have a page on your website that looks a little bit more like your Instagram. I don't mean like replicate it um, because Instagram is like the super friendly, I'm out at the coffee shop and I'm talking to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Like if we think of what kind of space it is, um, and I don't just mean the coffee shop, like I'm at a gallery opening with all my friends and we're talking and I'm, I'm in, I walk into somebody on the street and I, you know what I mean? Instagram is this kind of public, friendly, conversational space. And then you're like, wait, come to my studio. I want you to see, you know, the depth of what I do. So if you think of those spaces in that way, um, I think it's fine, like on your website to have, you might have a page that is like, I don't know, thoughts and thoughts and gathering, right? Like that is a little bit more like your Instagram page because clearly the Instagram page is a little more, oops, sorry, I gotta move this to click on it. <laughs> I got a Zoom thing in front of me here. Um, you know, is a little bit more conversational, right? Like there's fun pictures, there's very quick pictures. There's, here's a great progress shot, right? Mm -hmm. um, whoops, sorry. You, you know, know, there's actually, a great progress shot. Like you can have that on your website, why not, right? The website yeah, you can know. have- Actually, the, the new page that I just created 10 minutes ago, I was taking what you said into account and I thought, I'm going to just put a picture of my apartment where I work. Uh, I mean, I think that I think that shot is a pretty fantastic shot, right? Like it gives yeah. me a sense of scale. I see how you work. I, you know what I mean? Like anytime we can give somebody a physical, like a, a, an indication of how they might like how their body might be in relationship to the work is the way to think about it. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I think if you're, if you're, if you're someone who does music or someone who does video or something like that, that's also really important, right? Those things are, that's, those things are communicated really differently in real life than they are through the web. So I think it's just thinking about what are these little cues that I can put on the website that give people insight. So if you had the, one of those paintings on an easel or you had that apartment shot on your website, when I saw the paintings, I'm like, Oh, I see, these are actually quite large. They're this, you know, they're physical, they're this and that. Like we're, we're actually pretty, when we have information, our brains, you know, can be pretty savvy, right? Like it can, it can, yeah. it can follow, yeah. it can understand. And then I don't have to see a context shot for every single thing because I already understand that Junior's work is, you know, a certain type of uh, work, scale or whatever. Yes, 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 you're right. So I'm, I'm actually glad you said that this, this particular picture would be great for the website. It's a great shot. It's a because great shot. <laughs> that is what I just intended to do, to put it on the on the page, on the website as a first page. I want to stress this, that if you think of the website as a kind of a space, right? Like a building. I think of it as a building. I'm just like, a, I'm a visual person. Right? And I like, I have different rooms, right? I have like rooms where that are, you know, I have, a, I have the living room where I have my formal entertaining, right? That's where the portfolio is really professional. Everything is really clean and all that. And then I have my parlor where people come in and I give them a glass of wine. Maybe that's where you have studio shots or you have, you know, like your more like fun conversational things that might be on Instagram, that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I think that's uh, those are the ways to think about it. It can be helpful to think about that because then you're like, oh, there's the kitchen. The kitchen is like the info room. Right. Like that's yeah. where I'm going to find my, you know, how do I contact this person? What is, what is their artist statement? What are they you know, where did they go to school or what are they thinking about? Whatever it is, um, you know, it's, again, wanting people to get a sense of you as a, an artist and your practice, you and your practice. OK. 
sounds fantastic. That's great. <laughs> Any That's other questions? Awesome. Thank you I so much. We, I, we, Elizabeth, I think you have a question. Where's Elizabeth? I'm not. She's oh, there she is. I'm She's there, right next to me. Unmute. Yes. Now oh, there she is. Hi, Elizabeth. So this was a wonderful presentation and really provocative. I have a website, but I don't even know how to send it to you. But um, <laughs> the, the the question is, in part, I have many. I'm making pieces for almost thirty years, and I haven't. Unfortunately, I haven't sold them. Some of the the older pieces are quite large. Many times when I think they are appropriate for sending to an exhibition or something, uh, the exhibition limits the, the years within which a piece has been made. You right. refer to that, Nuria refers to it. And um, this, is a, this is a real challenge to me since I would like some, I mean, I made pieces about the Iraq war quite a few years ago. I can change the titles, but hey, really, still relevant, right? I, oh, it's very relevant, unfortunately, yes. All of the war pieces, but I don't feel you can't say you're making your piece that was done for let's say 2010. How are you going to send it out for 2021? Or so 20. this is a framing question, right? And when I say framing, I don't mean picture framing, right? I mean, it's like, how do we create um, a kind of like a, you know, the, how do we conceptualize these different parts of our practice so that they make sense? Now, I will say that the art world is um, not so kind to women, let's just be frank. And so, and also older artists, right? And I think that, and I'm not assuming you're an older artist, but you've been working a long time, <laughs> right? In You're terms so of a mature artist, artist a mature weird. artist That's who's been undeniable. working. And you know what? That is uh, a, a tribute and, and amazing that you've kind of kept working through all of the stuff, right? Especially if you were not a commercial artist and you had to find other ways to support your practice. So to me, that is a framing question. It's like, how would I put that on the website in a way that doesn't make it seem like, oh, this is like old work, right? It's about how it is how it is contextualized in the website. So it's like how you would talk about it, how like how it would be put together, right? Into groups, like what the pages, how you would construct pages that would make sense of that. And then the other thing I would say is very often if, if people are participating in juried shows, juried shows almost always limit the time for, to two to five years. If it might be time for you who are a, a, a very accomplished artist who's been working a long time to put together proposals for solo exhibitions where you could show a breadth of work and a depth of work. And so that is a, um, you know, that is a, that is a, a again, a, I keep saying a framing question. I'm trying to think of a better word, but it's a, it's like how you talk of it, how you create the story around those bodies of work. You can, I mean, I think it's very possible to conceptualize work about the Iraq the first Iraq war in today's world, right? Because these things are not unconnected. So it is about how you talk about it and then how you put those images together in a way that doesn't make it seem like this is old work. Now, I think that the archive, like having an archive page on our website is often a good way to put older work that we don't, you know, that that is not stuff that we're gonna show like we might still show it because I mean I had a curator come to me recently and he wanted to show work that was from like 2005 and I was like oh my gosh you really want to show that work it's really old you know and he's like nope that's the work I want <laughs> you know and uh, it's a good thing it was on my website in archive because he remembered it you know from years ago so I don't think I mean and then I have other friends who like they take anything that's five years older they take it off their website immediately so there are different approaches but I think someone with a long mature practice I think there's a way to frame those different bodies of work in a way that you know makes them relevant because they are. We don't say Van Gogh is like dated work. You know what I mean? So it's really about how we talk about it. So I wanna encourage you to think about proposal writing as opposed to like, you know, submitting, and I don't know, I'm not saying, assuming that you don't do this already, but um, you know, submitting one work here, one work there, because um, a proposal to have an exhibition, especially in like maybe a university gallery or a nonprofit where you can unfold lots of ideas across the whole maturity of your practice can be really powerful. And it also can frame your work for your legacy as an artist, right? The other thing you can do is you can make, today it's really easy to make catalogs. Like PDF, 
catalogs. Some websites even have like I compendium. I'm sure that they all have this, right? If I have a gallery page on a website, there's an I can on the you know on the back side of my um, on the back side of the website make a PDF of that. So that means you kind of have an instant catalog, and then that catalog is something that can live as a you know as a document as an object. P catalogs now are not. Um, extraneous documents to an exhibition. I feel like one should do a catalog for every show one is one does because they continue the exhibition. They give, because again, how maybe 20, maybe 20 to 200 people are gonna come to your actual show, right? If you're really lucky, 200 to 500. But if you, but uh, you know, 10,000 people can view that catalog on your website. It's also something that you could print and you could send, right? Or you could include in packages and stuff. But anyway, that it's a different lecture, the proposal lecture. But um, I think there's a way and I want to advocate for, you know, artists who whose work has perhaps not been um, valued as much as it should be, or are working now in a place where, um, you know, they're they're not the cool, coolest, hottest thing. <laughs> Even though I bet you are the coolest, hottest thing I, I can tell already. <laughs> She is. I can vouch for that. Um, I'll send you my website. <laughs> I mean, you can, if you want to put it into the chat, you can. But someone said if you don't put dates on your work, I think yeah, that that was K uh, Capo Photography, right? That, that was I know. A, I think that some people do that. They just don't put dates, and I think I think that's okay. But you need to have dates for yourself. Like you need to make sure that you have dated the work yourself because there will be some instances where the date is required. You don't necessarily have to make that public. Right. Um, and if you're organizing your work by year, I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me that, you know, you're not like we don't artwork doesn't follow a calendar. You know what I mean? It's not like the 2021 person that you are is like vastly, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't make sense. So if you if you organize it by series or by projects or there's lots of different ways to do that, then um, you could have projects that are um, that are kind of together as a grouping of works like your Iraq war projects or works that someone wants to, feels like, you know, the date might harm the work, um, but can, they can present it as like a body of work. I think presenting things as a body of work is really powerful um, for, for curators and people who look at the websites. Um, so I'm, I don't, I'm not sort of, I don't think that, I don't think, I think it's, there's always an instance where that's going to be the right thing, right? To not have a date. If you don't want to have it on your website, that's fine. But if you are, if a curator comes to you, they're going to want the date. So make sure you have the date. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You might not non want to publicize it in, in that public space. That's okay. Although I think that at some point that becomes an issue in certain instances. Yeah. I, I think that's a great point. I think there are ways also around that. I mean, I think, you know, rain, date ranges can, can work. Um, or, you know, as you said, sort of, you know, kind of broader concepts that, you know, you see a development of an idea over Absolutely. time. And so if you can contextualize sort of time, I think that that makes a lot of sense because you know, there's always that fear where you're, you think, well, that's not relevant anymore because it was this many years ago. That's not, you, you know, I, I think there's that often false perception, but that there is that, that perception. I think that's, that's a good point there. I think there, but there, yeah. I think there are ways around that. I think the um, range thing is, is fabulous. And there are even artists who like Thomas Noskowski is a painter who abstract painter, fantastic, incredible painter who died just within the last few years, but he would work on paintings. He would have a painting that might have a date that was like 2008 to 2015. Yeah. You know, does it mean he was working on it continuously? No, but it meant that 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 painting was in play. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you don't want to do it sort of arbitrarily, but I think that, um, you know, we're, you know, I, I don't think artwork follows a calendar. So I think that right. there are really good questions. There are really good ways to think about yeah. that. I think that's right. Cause it can speak to your process. It can speak to your development. It can exactly speak to a lot of those more complex concepts that maybe a date doesn't necessarily reveal. And it might be um, that you go back to, you go back to like, you've been working on things right. and then like, Oh, this, like this, sure. the work, this curator that came and wanted to show this older work. Suddenly I was like, wow, Oh, that work is right. okay not not so bad you know I was like right. I was like oh okay it's not so I might want to revisit some of those ideas right it would be very different and that might bring those works back into the current yes. so if yes. if for example Elizabeth was working on you were working on you know projects around contemporary wars then then those project those images might fit very well inside of that particular kind of thing um I agree. I think I think that's great. Um, this is our last question, um, and then we are we are at our end here. Um, 
there's the question is, is there a place for artists who have not tried to show their work, but continually have worked for 30 to 40 years? So uh, is, is the question, is there a place to exhibit? Is that, I just want to be really clear that I understand the question. Um, I'm going to unmute here. Hi. 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 I just, I've continually worked, but I've always had a side business. Yeah. So I've never really put my work out there. And there's a lot of different work um, over that time period. And I don't know that that's why I asked about the dates. I'm not yeah. sure that yeah. my work has reference to contemp, you know, like something that's contemporary. I don't think it needs to be dated in other words, but I just, when I'm listening to this whole thing, it feels like curators aren't going to look necessarily unless you're constantly, you're something new or you, you know, no. No, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want this to sound discouraging really, because I think that what they're interested in is the work, right? And, and, and I just want to say something about the date because of what you said. I think that everything, nothing is outside of time. There's no artwork that is outside of time. So the time that it was made will always be reflected in some way in the work. So I don't, I mean, you shouldn't feel, I don't want to say, I don't want to shit on you. You, you, you know, I would, I would, um, I would encourage you to, to, to be, you know, say, hey, this is when it was made and, and to think about it. That doesn't mean you have to publicize it on your website. But I think that um, the dates do matter in that sense and that nothing is made outside of its time. So I, you can usually recognize when something was made 50 years ago and something was made today. And that is because all art is a conversation. It is a convert, it is art. Art is in a conversation with other art, even when we are not aware. So if you've been working on your own and you haven't been showing the work. So the work has not been circulating in that conversation. It's still in a conversation with contemporary ideas. And so I, th that's not a problem. Like it's not a problem to me that you, you haven't been circulating the work. Um, I think the bigger question is then figuring out what are the conversations that the work is having? Where are those conversations happening in the world? And how do I get to be a part of that? And for someone who hasn't been showing, there are kind of you know, there are juried shows, which are great ways to start, right? Those are in, in, fantastic ways to start. Not only do they get you into exhibitions, you know, I mean, look, there's rejections too. I mean, this, look, I could paper, you know, two apartments with, with them uh, myself, but, um, you know, but you also build community. Do you know what I mean? Um, you meet people when you do the shows and then you make connections and you meet other artists and you say, oh, I want to visit your studio. Do you want to visit my studio? Like you build, you begin to build a community. And I think that's really powerful. Um, and then you begin to look for opportunities that are not great shows, that are uh, opportunities where one can show your work. And I think university galleries are an amazing way for artists to show their work. Um, and that just means you have to kind of be able to craft the, the narrative. And I don't mean craft like makeup. I mean, like talk about the narrative of the work so that people will be like, wow, this show would be really interesting because this work is really great. And this artist is thinking about this. They're not going to, they know every artist starts somewhere. Now, does that mean, well, you're not going to show at, you know, Gagosian when you haven't been showing, right? But that's not really where I care to show anyway. So, you know what I mean? Like, I think that you, you want to find context where your work can begin to circulate. And um, once the work is circulating, then other people see it and engage with it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, since your work hasn't been circulating, you have a little work to do, but, but you know, social media is also an amazing way to start, right? To maybe craft little mini exhibitions on your Instagram page. This is this series. I've got 10 images from this series. This is what it's about you know, feedback. I mean, people find artists on Instagram a lot, a lot. So I think there are definitely ways um, to do it. And I wouldn't be, um, you know, look, being an artist is not an easy path. We wouldn't do it if it was. I mean, everyone would do it if it was, right? Uh, and so, you know, there are ups and downs, there are rejections, there are all those kinds of things. And I think that I work a lot with artists on trying to craft a kind of, you know, like a, a, a sustainable ecosystem that works for them, right? So do you, are you interested in commercial galleries? That's a certain kind of, you know, you aim your direction in this way. Are you, work, are you interested in nonprofits? You kind of aim your information that way. It doesn't mean you can't do both, but we will often have a kind of, a, um, you know, a focus. Um, so I would say to you, jury shows and um, university galleries and, you know, small, small nonprofits. And even, uh, let me tell you, even I, I'm working with an artist who'd never, he didn't work for 30 years and he's just started to make work. And he now has his work in two, you know, furniture design stores. And he's thrilled. He's like, the work is good. They do a little opening. They do, you know what I mean? 
it's um he doesn't care that it's not a you know a sort of fancy gallery it's like getting his work out there he's meeting people he's building community and he'll that's one step right that worked really well with him so i think that um i'm not a snob about this i think you do what's right for your practice and um i can i can end on a story where i was someone asked me to show in this restaurant and i was like i was really busy i was doing all these other things and i was like oh god i don't know should i be doing this am i at the point where i i don't show in restaurants anymore you know it's asking myself that question and i and i did it and it, you know it was wonderful and i ended up selling like a bunch of work like expensive work and i was like well note to self you know what i mean like you can do anything you can craft any situation to be inside your own ethical aesthetic is what i would say right that's how i would frame it and so you you make choices about how you want to show where you want to show how you want to sell where you want to sell the kinds of communities that you want your work to circulate in and in that way you can build a really beautiful community uh, for yourself and for your work that's great Thank you, thank you so much. This is truly, I mean, this has been so rich and 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 really so much information, I think. Thank so thank you so much for being here, Patricia, and sharing your thank expertise you. and your experience.